Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event, the GovTech Academy, what every law enforcement agency needs to know about social media. My name is Morgan Wright. I'm a senior fellow here at Government Technology. Look, this is going to be fun. I've been talking to everybody uh, before we got on the air here today, and this is going to be great. You guys are in for a very important. session. This one's 90 minutes because this is an academy, so you're really going to be taken to school by a lot of people who know their stuff. But before we begin, just a couple brief housekeeping notes. We'll make a recording of this presentation available to everybody within 48 hours. Use it for your reference. Pass it along to your colleagues. It is interactive. You'll see a Q&A button down at the bottom, and folks, what we do is after the end of each presenter's uh, time, we'll do a Q&A then. We're not going to save the Q&A till the very end, so after the each end of each segment, We'll be doing Q&A, so make sure you get your questions in for that presenter while they're talking. Uh, at the same time, if you want to download the presentation, click down there at the bottom. Uh, you'll see uh, the webinar resources. You can download a PDF of the slides. And if you do want to tweet, put it out there. Use the hashtag GovTechLive to connect with everybody. And at the close of the webinar today, we do encourage you to complete just a brief survey about the presentation. This is why we went to an academy. Based on your feedback, people said we want to go a little bit deeper uh, not every week, but we want to go a little bit deeper. The result is GovTech Academy. So let us know what you think. And if you have to leave beforehand, don't worry. It's going to pop up. Just make sure you fill it before you go. Otherwise, it'll pop up once the webinar concludes. So at this time, strap in, get ready. We're going to have some fun here. Uh, disable your pop-up blockers. If you're experiencing any media player issues or any other problems, Amari, um, our crack uh, technical staff from On24, is on the line to help you guys. So let's get started. So I am honored today to have four great presenters joining me today on this very timely topic. The first one is Jennifer Herber. The second one is going to be Chris Shung, uh, Chief Billy Grogan, and Anil Chavla, Founder and Chief Executive Officer for Archive Social. Before I do that, though, let me show you. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, you'll see the agenda here. We're going to go through it. I'm going to talk to you real quickly about social media by the numbers. Um, Jennifer is going to talk to you about how law enforcement agencies can get started with social media. Um, Chris Shung is going to talk about crisis communications. Anil is going to talk about the critical need. And this really is to archive and manage your social media risk. And then uh, Chief Grogan, a little bit different take here. He's going to talk about how to build a positive relationship with your audience using humor. So let me kick this off here real quick. So let's talk off by social media by the numbers. And there's really only three numbers you need to worry about. And those numbers are one, two, and three. So let's talk about the first one. The first one, number one, what's the first thing we talk about? Anytime you deal with social media folks, that is normally the First Amendment. There are a ton of First Amendment issues that uh, just uh, invade everything we do in social media when you're a public safety agency. You have to worry about censorship. You have to worry about comments. You have to worry about can we delete things. And there have been lawsuits over deleted comments. There have been lawsuits over comments that were allowed to stand, things that probably shouldn't have been posted. And Neil's going to talk about some of that. So definitely, folks, the First Amendment is a huge issue we're going to talk about. So let's talk about the number two. What's the second thing we talk about? At the, at the Center for Digital Government uh, and Government Technology, where I'm a senior fellow, we do a biannual survey, and we talk to states about what some of the most pressing issues are and what are the things they expect out of social media, the, their interactions with government. There's two things people are talking about that they want out of their government. The first one is transparency. They want to see the process in action. They don't want to have dark corners. They want to be able to shine a light on what's going on. So we need to have transparency. The second thing they want is accountability. First thing is transparency. Second thing is accountability. We want to know what's going on, and we want to know who we can hold accountable for those results. So those are things you'll find as well in social media. Now, the third one is a little bit more fun here. This is where we talk about um, what are the three things that you really have to have when you consider deploying some of this technology, social media. And I've broken it down into very three simple steps. The first one is um, policy. If you don't get to do anything without going through policy, if you want to drive a car, what do you do? You sit down in the class, you look at policy. You want to become a police officer, what do you do? You're in the academy first, you're learning policy. You want to do anything, you learn policy. So the first thing you have is, what do you want? Do you have a good policy in place? What are the outcomes you expect? Second one is training. You just can't give it to people. Training dog there says, hey, look, you've given me a policy. Now train me on the behaviors you want me to exhibit. I want you to steer like this. I want you to turn like this. I want you to do things like this. So you give them the policy. You give them the training. Because I'm telling you, folks, before you can get the wicked cool technology, nobody gets into the uh, fighter seat or the seat of this F-117 Frisbee stealth fighter 
I guarantee you without a ton of classroom work, a ton of simulator work, which is the training and behavior, before they get to the technology. And so why is this so important? Because otherwise you end up with something like this. For example, Facebook, sorry, you're doing it wrong, but I think the, the, the one I enjoy the most here is, yes, this is uh, the actress herself, Lindsay Lohan, saying, hello, Facebook. Yes, this is actually Lindsay. Welcome to my Facebook page. As she says that on Twitter. So just be careful of what you say. People do pay attention to what's going on on social media. So, hey, let's talk and let's get started with this. I've done my part, kind of introduced things. So let me introduce you first to Jennifer Herber. She's a senior public information specialist at the Austin Police Department. Now, what I'm going to do is Jennifer has actually asked us to pose a question, which I'm going to do, let you look at it while I read the rest of her bio. So first question Jennifer would like to ask you folks is how does your agency share press conferences with your community? Periscope or Facebook Live? You record and you post the video on YouTube. You rely on media outlets to cover your press conferences or something else. Periscope, Facebook Live, record and post. Rely on media outlets or something other. So while you're doing that, let me tell you a little bit more about Jennifer. She is a senior public information specialist with the Austin Police Department, official motto of the city of Austin, which I know is happened to keep Austin weird. Uh, she has more than 18 years of experience working in public relations and communications. She began her career in the nonprofit sector, which is also government. And then moved, but moved over to the local government 10 years ago. She's a native Austinite. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism from West Texas A&M University. She is past president of the Austin chapter of the International Association of Business Communicators, as you'll see, won several communication awards. And she serves as APD's main social coordinator. She develops messaging. She moderates. She evaluates their social media efforts. And since 2012, APD has beefed up its use of social media. Its Twitter audience has grown from only 1,200 followers to 50,000 in just three short years, and the APD public information team was recognized in September for their use of the What the Helicopter hashtag by Austin Chronicle's Best of Austin Issue. You're going to have to explain that to us here, Jennifer. So the team won also an award for the American Statesman Top Ten Social Media Award for What the Helicopter and their overall social media efforts. This is going to be fun. I want to hear about this. So I'm actually going to turn this over to you, Jennifer. The floor is now yours. Actually, I'm sorry. Okay. Quick readout on the results. I'm um, yeah. sorry. I was, getting, I was getting excited to hear about the helicopter. Um, three, <laughs> three and a half percent say you use Facebook Live or Periscope. Nobody posts it or on video or YouTube. That's interesting. 78%, Jennifer, rely on the media to cover this, and about 18% do something other. Wow, 78% rely on the media. I think you're going to tell us why there's another alternative to that, aren't you? Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Morgan, and thanks for everybody to, for joining us today. Um, one little update on my bio, um, we now have almost 79,000 followers on Twitter, so we're really proud of that. <laughs> and I will tell you a little bit more about uh, the, what, the hel what the Helicopter hashtag. Um, I just kind of wanted to, to start out with um, basically why social media, why that's so important. Um, I still have people ask me, you know, why, why should law enforcement use social media? Why is that important? And to me, that's surprising because we've been using it so much that, I, you know, it's hard for me to understand why wouldn't you? We're, we live in such a wild, wired world. And here in Austin, of course, we're probably one of the most wired cities in the nation. But, um, you know, it is the number one way that people receive their news now. Pretty much everyone has a smartphone or a tablet. Um, and so, you know, it's just the best way to reach folks. And, uh, even smaller agencies, though, can benefit. Um, almost everyone is on some form of social media, and it's a great way to engage with your community and share information. And, of course, the biggest reason is it builds trust within your community, and it just adds to that transparency, which is also so important with law enforcement, of course. So I'm just going to start out here by uh, – this is a cute little graphic that kind of explains the different kinds of social media, at least the ones that we use here at APD. Um, you know, there's always that joke about cops and donuts, um, so I thought I'd use donuts to explain all the different ones. I'll let you guys read through those yourselves, um, but here at Austin, we use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Periscope, YouTube, and then Nextdoor.com, and then our relatively new uh, tool that we started using is we actually have a mobile app. Um, it's called Austin PD, and you can get it for free on iTunes or for Android. And some of the ways that we use social media are to, to talk to our folks about critical or major incidents, anytime we have weather, flooding, things like that. Um, of course, road closures and traffic. Traffic is a huge issue here in Austin, and I'm sure it is in a lot of other cities as well. Um, and then, of course, evergreen messages like um, don't drink and drive, arrive alive, and for our marketing campaigns. 
and, and also to tell some of those good stories that don't get told in, in the mainstream media. So the first one I'm going to talk to you all about is Twitter. This is our uh, Twitter handle. Um, as we mentioned, we've grown quite a bit from 1,200 to now almost 79,000. Um, I think most people know Twitter is very short messaging. It's 140 characters. We have lots of engagement on our Twitter feed. Um, it's very conversational. It's the best way to get our information out fast. Um, we can post photos and videos. Um, and then, you know, when we first started out on Twitter back in 2012, immediately our media partners started following us and talking to us through Twitter. Um, you know, we still notify them other ways when we have media availabilities or something going on, but they, they look at Twitter first, um, and that's still the case. Um, we, uh, we've had some um, critical events here in Austin. One of them happened during the South by Southwest um, Music Festival, Music and Film Festival. We had a driver crash into a crowd of people, um, and several people were killed, and um, even more were injured, and it was, it was very, very um, chaotic, as you can imagine. We had a lot of folks here a lot of folks looking for loved ones, and that was kind of the biggest um, growth period that we had um, with Twitter. We were able to get the messages out very quickly, and people were able to find out what was going on. Um, one other thing on Twitter is hashtags are really big, and um, speaking of hashtags, people always ask what the heck are hashtags and how do they work. Um, I mentioned the what the helicopter, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, transfer over to that and tell you a little bit about our what the helicopter. How that came about was um, we were getting calls about our helicopter activity, a lot of calls every single day. And of course, all the good stuff happens in the middle of the night, and it wakes people up, and they wonder why the helicopter's up in the air. So we started tweeting about it, but it wasn't in real time. We were tweeting the next morning. Um, soon after that, we started looping in our watch lieutenants who work overnight shifts, and they started tweeting for us. And then um, we, were, we were at a, actually a community meeting. Me and a coworker were at a community meeting, and she was talking about how people can call us and find out what the helicopter's doing in your neighborhood. And something stuck, and I said, hey, I'm going to try that hashtag. And I asked my boss if it was okay. So um, after that, we started using hashtag what the helicopter. And it took off. Um, people now tweet it at us if we're not quick enough to uh, send out a tweet and let people know what's going on. Um, they actually tweet it at us. And if you search Twitter now, and look for hashtag what the helicopter, it's mostly us. I think the only thing I would have done differently is maybe added on what the helicopter ATX or something just so people knew it was just Austin. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is um, Periscope. Um, it looks like most of you guys uh, were relying on media to get the word out on your press conferences. And we do that as well, of course. Um, but one thing we had started um, talking about was that we wanted to start live streaming our press conferences so that we could get our entire message out, not just um, the little 20 seconds that ends up on the news. So uh, Periscope, real quickly, is a live streaming video app owned by Twitter. Um, we started using it about June of 2015, and it also allows media outlets, since their departments are so lean now, um, to, to see what's happening, even if they can't make the press conference. And I'm going to speed up a little bit because I'm about to run out of time here. Um, we also use Facebook. As you know, Facebook, um, you can tell a, bit, a little bit longer story on Facebook. You can post more pictures, albums, things like that. We also have Instagram. This one, um, I've made a goal this year to start using it more. Um, obviously, it's a much younger audience. It's photo and video driven. You can use filters on your photos. And the videos are 15 seconds long. We also use Nextdoor.com, which is really great for pushing out our district representatives, officers who work in each of our districts, their updates. You can um, target niche uh, neighborhoods like that and talk about commander's forums meetings, coffee with a cop, send out safety tips. Um, and it's run entirely by the neighborhood. Um, we can push out our own specific information, but um, Nextdoor has been a great tool for us. And then, of course, is our app that I mentioned earlier. It's free for city citizens. It's available on iPhone and Android, and it allows our citizens to stay informed and engaged. It also allows our folks to um, submit anonymous tips. So how can you get started with all this? It can be kind of overwhelming, obviously, if, if you uh, haven't done it yet. I think the first thing is to set out a plan, um, create a personal account first to practice, 
and then start with one social media outlet. Don't try to do it all because that will get overwhelming. Start with one, do it well, um, see what works, see what doesn't work. And then really the biggest thing is to create relevant content um, that's timely and informative. And then the last thing is to follow some other folks who are doing it well. Um, also, make sure you have a social media policy. Reach out to some of the other agencies and see what they have in place. Um, we follow the City of Austin social media policy. Um, also, make sure you are assigning staff members to, um, to do the posting and to the, do the maintaining. The maintaining part of it is probably the biggest role. And then, obviously, make sure you're using that social media, those social media channels to have two-way conversations and to engage your community. And how do you manage all this? It can get kind of overwhelming. Some of the tools that we use here at APD are um, Hootsuite. We use Hootsuite to schedule posts and then also to monitor what people are saying about you. They have some great, um, even free tools if you have, you know, a small enough uh, audience. There are some others, TweetDeck, Spread, SpreadFast, Sprout Social. There's probably a bunch more that I didn't list there. And then, of course, Archive Social can help you um, with archiving your social media and also one of the best things that they have is the alerts. Uh, we get a lot of questions through social media and also quite a bit of profanity, unfortunately, um, posted to us. So, so Archive Social has been really helpful in that aspect. I know I went through that really fast. Um, hopefully that helps you um, have an idea of how we got started and how you can too. Uh, Morgan, I'm going to go ahead and kick it back over to you. Well, don't go anywhere yet, Jennifer. We've got a couple questions here for you. So, hey, let's oh, okay. talk for just a minute about, yeah, yeah, let's talk a little bit about what the helicopter. Um, now that you're doing that, how has that changed the expectation of the community? Are you finding out that they're just more interested? Or are people in those areas where they see the helicopters actually, like, say, feeding you in leads or tips or helping out in whatever activity it is that you may be engaged in? Oh, that's a great question. Um, we, we actually do find that people are more interested. Um, people were always pretty interested in why the helicopter was up, because like I said, it always happens in the middle of the night um, <laughs> when you're fast asleep and it wakes you up. Um, and so what we found is people are asking us more why the helicopter's up. And um, it's really funny. Sometimes the helicopter will go up in the middle of the day, and it if I'm not on top of it, we'll have 10 people writing us, what the helicopter, you know, and so I have to really stay on top of it, too. Uh, one challenge we've had is um, the, the watch lieutenants who work up there overnight are always rotating in and out. And so we really had to set up a, a training program for them because most of those folks had never seen Twitter, or had no desire to use Twitter. Um, and so we really set uh, up a little, it's, it's not a real intense training. It's a pretty pretty basic Twitter 101 um, class for them that we do, and we do that periodically so that um, when the new people come in, they also know about the what the helicopter and, and the other tweets well, that I, we I, want them to send out. <laughs> you know, that's that's a great program. It's also it's, it's it's a catchy name too. So, hey, a couple other questions here too. So, I, I noticed you said that um, you use Periscope, um, and obviously everybody hears about Facebook Live. Why did you choose Periscope over Facebook Live? Was there a performance issue? Was there an issue of comments? Why did you know why one over the other? And that's a good question. Um, really, the answer to that is we um, we're early adopters. <laughs> we really wanted to. Uh, we've been talking about a way to do this, and when we started hearing about um, all the different live streaming apps that were coming out, Periscope came out first. Um, I went to a conference and kind of used it personally and tried it out, and it worked. So I came back to work after that very next press conference we had, um, I used it, and it worked perfectly. Um, in fact, our chief made a beeline for me afterwards, and he, he wanted to know how to do it, and we walked around the building for 30 minutes afterwards, and he was uh, doing it himself, and he, he still uses it as well. So um, really, that was, that was it. We started with them, um, and then, of course, Facebook Live rolled out, and um, we talked a little bit about maybe switching over to that, but we have a larger Twitter following, so we felt like it was um, probably best if we stuck with Periscope since it's owned by Twitter. And because you guys have grown your Twitter following, and obviously, you know, uh, unfortunately, sometimes that, that happens because of certain events. You you increase right. the following, people want to know what's going on. Can you can you talk a little bit about? Have you heard feedback from officers or other command staff? By the way, I'm shocked that lieutenants would be adverse to being on Twitter. I mean, I thought that they were the cutting edge type of you know supervisors, but um, <laughs> that's that's a joke to you, lieutenants out there. But are you finding what are some of the benefits as you've gotten some of this more engagement, albeit because of some bad incidents? But 
Are you finding better engagement? Are you finding um, better I interactions for the officers? What have been some of the outcomes, the benefits that you've got from all of this increased engagement? Yeah, I think it, you know, honestly, it really rolls into our community policing model. Um, it's just one more way that we have to engage. And it's not just talking at our public either. It's, it's actually engaging with them. Um, one of the things I do every day is to make sure I answer any questions that are coming in via social media. Um, and obviously, if we have a critical incident going on, that gets a little difficult sometimes because there's a lot going on. Um, but yeah, I really, I think we've had a lot. We've had a lot of... Um, People love it that APD is, is on Instagram, for example. They think it's really cool, and, and they, of course, still love the What the Helicopter, but they also really appreciate it when, particularly traffic tweets, um, if there's a crash and it's closed down a major roadway right before rush hour, because, of course, that's when major crashes happen. Um, we try to get that information out there so that people have it. Um, if there's a bank robbery, if there's something else going on people need to know about, we try to get that out there. So, yeah, so far everything's been pretty positive. And now that you guys are posting on Instagram and other things, what do you find that are tending to be the most popular type of posts uh, other than critical incidents or people reacting to things? But have you found that there's a theme to things like on a Wednesday people expect this? I mean, kind of like the what the helicopter has become a theme. Have you guys found any other kind of following or uh, engagement based on a certain like, hey, we love to see pictures of the canines or we like the motorcycles or the bikes, anything like that? I was actually going to mention um, animals. Yes, anytime you can add um, children, <laughs> children or puppies, it's kind of that same basic rule, really, of advertising. <laughs> um, th those are our most popular. In fact, my nephew came up to our police station once, and um, I think he's adorable, of course, but um, he still, I think, has the most likes on our Instagram page because we took a picture of him with some of our officers. So that seems to be the most popular. <laughs> hey, and, and last question here before we move on. Uh, actually, this one, I'm, I'm going to try and make sure that I can also get people's names here. I think it's Natalie French, City of Doral. She asks, what is the best way to increase your followers on either Twitter and or Facebook? What have you found, Jennifer, that works for you guys? You know, I think um, getting um, your media partners on board to follow you, um, when they start mentioning you in their posts, I think that has helped a lot. Um, and I think it goes back to what you're posting. Um, also, make sure it's timely and it's it's relevant information and really that engagement, too. If you're actually engaging back and forth with people um, through word of mouth, really, and really with other people seeing that you're doing that, other people will follow you. I hope that, hope that helps. No, that's great. Hey, look, thank you, Jennifer, for your time. Hang around in case some other questions come in, but thank you very much. Thank now, you. we're going to move to our next person here, and uh, let's get let's bring his picture up. Let me introduce you to Captain Chris Shung. Chris is from Mountain View PD, yes, home of Google. He commands the Support Operations Division at the Mountain View Police Department, and since 2012, he's managed their social media strategy, platforms, and engagement with the community. He also blogs for the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the ICP, Center for Social Media, writes articles, and has spoken at lots of conferences around the country on the topic of law enforcement and their use of social media. And this is important to engage the community. And what Chris is going to focus on today, too, is about how to manage crisis communications. He's the PIO Regional Vice Chair for the Southwest US IA, or IACP. And he's also a social media instructor for California Post and a social ambassador for the home publication here today, GovTech. He was recently recognized as the ELGL Chris Traeger, Top 100 Local Government Influencers for his work which is outstanding, Chris. Uh, congratulations on that, by the way. Uh, influence on law enforcement social media. He's been serving Mountain View for over 21 years. He looks too young in that picture, doesn't he, guys? And he's held a variety of assignments within MVPD. And these include detective, near and dear to my heart, in property crimes, person crimes, high-tech crimes, as well as 13 years on the SWAT team as an assault member, a rappel master. I'd like to hear about that, sniper and tactical commander. He uh, graduated from the prestigious Harvard Kennedy School of Government, which that, folks, that's a great place to be, and in state and local government, and has a master's degree in e-business management from Notre Dame, the Manure, in, or Namur, yes, in Belmont, California. You can follow him at chmtnviewpd, like Chris Young, mtnviewpd, or connect on LinkedIn. So, hey, Chris, um, first question we're going to do, let me throw this question out, which is what I should have had up here. Again, excited to talk about these things. But, folks, this one is to select all that applies. So um, what platform does your agency use to manage crisis communications online? So select all that applies, like Twitter, is it Facebook, is it Nextdoor, is it Nixle, or is it something else? So what platform does your agency use to manage crisis communication? 
uh, select Twitter, Facebook, Nextdoor, Nexel, some of the above, all of the above, or other. And hopefully I didn't butcher that name uh, where you got Notre Dame D. Namur. Is that correct, Chris? That is correct. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see what the results are and see if I did any better on that. Okay, look. So uh, this is interesting, Chris. So about 56% use Twitter, which we know is 84% Facebook. That's kind of different than what Jennifer was talking about, why they use Twitter instead, better engagement. Uh, 15%, 16% next door, 16% Nixle as well, and 48% others. So, I mean, that's kind of across the board, which kind of gets into what you want to talk about, especially with the crisis communication. So, hey, Chris, let me turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Morgan, and uh, good afternoon uh, for those of you on the west or the east coast. And uh, it's almost lunchtime for me on the west coast here. But uh, hello from Mountain View, California, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to just spend a few minutes talking about crisis communications. But before we do that, and it's really interesting to see the uh, poll results, is uh, to for all of the attendees to have the understanding that the different platforms you use are just that. They're very, very different. Each one behaves differently. Um, each one hits different audiences, and you almost need to write specifically um, depending on which platform you're on. Um, some of you, uh, as you see the screen in front of you here, um, may use Nextdoor, Facebook, Twitter, or Nixle, or a combination thereof. Um, if you do use those, one of the huge takeaways is I really want to discourage you from cross-posting on each platform. What that means is basically um, they, th these platforms make it easy for you to check a box so that you're blasting it, say, from Facebook to automatically blast at Twitter. Um, you get really, really low engagement rates when that happens. Um, and you, uh, the reasoning is, is you have to look at all of these platforms as what they are. They're competitors to each other. So Facebook has a vested interest to keep you on Facebook. Twitter has a vested interest to keep you on Twitter. So when you blast something from Facebook over to Twitter, Twitter is going to strip away the pictures. They're going to make the links look different. Um, so it's always best to post natively from within each one. Um, as you look at the uh, platforms that, uh, on the screen there, we um, actually use three out of the four. Um, we have since not used uh, Nixel as much uh, because we found that um, just in real time with engagement, you're seeing a lot more engagement on the platforms like Twitter, Nextdoor, and Facebook. Um, a word of advice on um, reach with Facebook is um, I noticed a lot of you on the poll use Facebook. Um, that's good and it's bad because typically um, what the metrics show out there is that only 3 to 6% of your followers see your actual post. And the, the takeaway there is as a um, government entity, Facebook treats your page a little bit differently than it treats, um, say, your friend, you and your friend's personal pages. So you're basically competing against thousands of other pages out there to be surfaced on people's smartphones or their computers. Um, and if you do use Facebook in crisis communications, the, a huge thing is to make sure you make one post and you update that same post over the course of the crisis. Um, I say that because if you do separate posts, those posts may show up at different times in your Facebook followers' feeds. Um, Twitter, by far for us, is the go-to platform for crisis communications management, and that's because the media is heavily there, um, and, and you can do really quick um, updates. There's no algorithm that limits uh, your tweet um, to the, the audience that you have. Um, and uh, the other thing that we really, really enjoy working with is Nextdoor, and that's because Nextdoor is 100% um, your residence, and they're verified, and there's no algorithm. So when we push an emergency message out, um, we're pretty much guaranteed that 100% of the people that are on Nextdoor in our city are going to see that message, and the added bonus is they can write questions back that we will be ready to answer. You don't get that on Facebook. So that's just kind of setting the stage, um, and it's really, really important to make sure that you actually speak digital because, um, you know, as government entities, as government drones, as I like to joke about, we are fantastic at uh, sounding boring a lot. We write very boring press releases, right? So there's a certain language on, on digital media, and that's just that. You need to be able to speak digital um, because digital fluency matters, and each platform actually has its own accent, if you think of it that way. Um, so just, just a couple things to, to take away there. Um, what I also want to touch on today is, um, just breaking it down here, is as we get into um, a crisis, what that looks like. Um, we here at Mountain View like to think about having two different cadences. 
One is just your normal run-of-the-mill everyday feel-good stories that we might post, the puppies, the kids, the lemonade stands. Um, but when crisis happens, we switch tones, and we have a very um, matter-of-fact uh, and more authoritative tone. And so what you definitely want to do is put out holding statements um, and messaging. And I'll show you a couple examples of what that looks like. But what you want to be careful about is, and I see this a lot online, is some agencies will tend to um, not want to put stuff out on social and maybe just wait and see um, if it takes off. Now, there is a certain art form to that, and I, I actually say that's a good thing because, um, as we all know, we certainly don't have all of the information as officers are responding to a scene, and it's normally in the first 10 or 15 minutes we're still trying to figure out what's going on. But on the flip side, if you're monitoring your social media channels and you start to see the public and the media starting to talk about that incident, that's the time when you need to jump in because there's a very critical element at the onset of a crisis. And that's the opportunity to take control of the narrative, get in the driver's seat of information, and to put out these statements. Because if you don't, someone else is going to drive that boat for you and so, or someone's going to drive that bus for you, um, and you're going to spend more time, energy, and efforts and resources trying to put down rumors or put down misinformation. So let's see what that looks like. Um, if, with regard to holding statements, um, sometimes I've seen agencies put out something like, please stay out of the area due to quote-unquote police activity. Be careful with that because inevitably someone's already there. Um, they're already tweeting about it from the scene, and they're probably including pictures. So you're going to have to eventually follow up and answer them and say, okay, yes, it's a barricaded subject or it's a traffic accident. Just go ahead and say what it is. Um, the example you see before you here, go over to Google Maps, do a real quick screenshot. Visual photos included in any post on most platforms are going to get you a little bit more engagement, and it's going to be more eye-catching. So just state what you have. People understand that this information might change. I know there's administrators out there who are hesitant and they don't want to put any information out until you have everything. Unfortunately, in this day and age, we don't have that luxury. Um, news breaks on Twitter, and within minutes, um, you know, and, and I, I look down to what happened in San Bernardino, California, right? You had people tweeting from the scene, from within the crime scene, and if you're not quick enough, you really need to be able to address that um, to help with your crisis comms messaging. Um, also, what you want to do is, as the incident unfolds, is to have a cadence. Now, there, there's no set time, but, um, you know, as you get information, obviously every 5, 10, 15 minutes is great. On the long end of the scale, perhaps every 15 to 20 minutes, you, you want to be present in the, um, in the social media chatter because if you're not, others on the, out in social media or the media will start to fill that blank with conjecture. They'll start thinking of different theories of what happened. So there's a lot of different ways that you can say the same thing without um, you know, repeating yourself over and over. And this example here is a Facebook screenshot of an um, actual incident. And this is what I'm describing is the bottom paragraph is the initial post. And then what you always want to do is get in the habit of updating the, just one post, editing it, putting a timestamp. Um, and what these timestamps are, it's basically a historical record uh, of what you're doing. And in this case, you know, we want to have these kind of power words that say we're focused on talking to the individual while keeping the community safe. That's the narrative that you would see and the theme that you would see in the majority of the messaging for an incident like this. Because in, in the end, if we end up unfortunately having to use force, um, the narrative is there. We've shown that we, we're trying to do this in a peaceful resolution. Um, so that's very, very important to kind of keep up and, and going. And again, when you can, you know, this is just saying the same thing with a different way of saying it is going back to Google. Uh, we use a tool called Google Maps Lite. It's free. You can draw little lines, um, you know, pictures and everything on top of the map. Graphical interfaces are always great to just show people in a snapshot what's going on um, to do that. And then you want, you want to make sure at the end of any incident is to close it out. Um, don't forget, this is really important. Otherwise, people are going to keep retweeting your initial message even though it's been over for an hour or so. So always go to each platform that you initially blasted it out and go back and say, you know, just wrap it up and, and thank the partners that might have helped you out um, and thank the public for being patient, for being inconvenienced.
Um, and lastly, you know, look at the feedback. People are going to write um, different things, and you want to take advantage of social media's two-way engagement. This is where the money is right here is um, people talking about stuff. And if you, if, uh, hopefully you can see the comment that this uh, guy left on the bottom that I circled. But um, this is the difference right here is when you take the community along for the ride during this crisis, they are more apt to understand what you did, why you did, what you were forced to do. Um, in the absence of all that information in this social media age, people are going to jump to conclusions or they're going to jump to what they know, and what they know is Hollywood and the media. And that's not a, that usually doesn't end up really well for us in public safety. So um, I'll wrap it up there. I'll send it back to Morgan uh, for any questions that you might have. Hey, first of all, Chris, you have to tell me, what is a rappel master? <laughs> that's a person on the SWAT team who uh, specializes in uh, tying knots and getting the team down a building using ropes. Uh, and is there such a thing truly as the Australian crawl? There is. It's uh, when you're going face down and you're walking down the wall. It's, it's quite fun. I think I did that once, but it wasn't intentionally. That's the way I ended up, but that's why I was not a rappel master. <laughs> so, hey, well, actually, a couple good things. You know, we, we heard this. Uh, Jennifer started talking about this. You talked about the media, and we know that the media, there's been a big shift, right, because we've lost a lot of people out of the newsrooms. There aren't as people anymore, so the way you report news has changed. So, where does the media fit in all of this? How do you partner with them now versus the way back in the day, you know, when I started in 1981, you know, it, it was totally different. You relied totally on the media. Where do, where do they fit in all of this now in this new digital age? That's, that's a really good question. So it's, it's turned the par paradigm upside down. It used to be just like you said, where you put out a press release and you rely on your media partners to put it out. Sometimes they did put it out, sometimes they didn't, or sometimes they added their own color commentary. Social media completely changes that. Uh, here in the Bay Area, what we've seen is media outlets now go to the police agency's Twitter page or Twitter feed, and the agencies that use it effectively, the media basically writes uh, and retweets stuff. So our takeaway from that is we provide a lot of the photos, a lot of the video. We'll even write the story as if we were the newspaper writer, and we write it in a, a non-governmental, non-press release format. We'll include quotes. We'll include videos. And really what that does is it allows you to be the author of the narrative of you know, what you want out there and who's going to be the most accurate, and that's going to be us because we have you know, the most accurate information at the time. So, um, again, it goes back to being in the driver's seat of information. As these incidents roll out, the media around us, they're more than happy to retweet updates that we put out. But if we don't put those updates out, we're basically forcing their hand. They're going to have to fill that space with opinions or, and stuff like that. Right, and that's one thing I was going to get to, too. It used to be sometimes it was very contentious. I mean, you and I can probably go back years and look at some press conferences, things that were just contentious because the media needed information and they weren't getting it. How do you think the relationship now with the media has changed now in this new social media era? Do you, do you, because you guys are in the heart of everything between Google, Cisco, you know, the, the, the whole Silicon Valley. They're pretty tech savvy out there. How has your relationship with the media changed over the past two years? Um, I know from my perspective as well as a few other PIOs in the region that it's actually gotten a lot better. Um, and we're very apt, very quick on Twitter to praise uh, reporters or stations, you know, thanks for sharing that news story. If they put out misinformation or, or, you know, it's not intentional always, you know, if they put something out, we'll go on to Twitter and we'll tag that news agency and say, hey, just FYI, here's the correct information. Um, if you want an awesome example of that, just go to Dallas PD's feed during that really horrific and tragic day. They did a phenomenal job in correcting misinformation that the media was putting out by calling the media out in a very professional way, but just listing it out there. And I think, you know, journalists at the heart, they want to be correct, right? And, and they, they don't want right. to go off of misinformation as well. So, and what we've done is make a concerted effort to visit each of the news agencies uh, around us, the outlets. We take our PIO team and we go visit their newsrooms, they get a really cool tour, but more importantly, shake hands and get to know the faces behind their digital platforms so they know who we are, we know who they are. Yeah, and after we just got a couple comments in, some of Tracy, uh, I think, Bigone, uh, Fort Lauderdale mm -hmm. Police, totally agrees with that. Corey Thompson, Water and Light Department, he actually had a quick comment. We got another question for you, Chris. He said, uh, Corey was saying just a comment, said their major new paper got quite angry when a press release was issued on Facebook and the other media outlets beat them to the report. Folks, that's why you got to learn how to favorite your police departments. Uh, and learn how to track what's going on. Hey, um, exactly. speaking of crisis, 
you know, because there's such a flow of information, there can be a danger of too much coming out at one time. So what's the cadence? What's it, what, how quickly do you need to post information online when there's a genuine crisis happening? What we found is um, we're looking at both the chatter. We'll do search terms um, around the whatever keywords that might be happening. If this is a big enough crisis, absolutely create your own hashtag because if you don't, someone's going to create it for you. And you want to create your own because you want to Google search that potential hashtag ahead of time just to make sure it's not associated with something else that might be negative. You create that hashtag or you see the sentiment of what's going on, that'll give you a very good ruler by which to know how often you need to put stuff out. But in general, you know, every three to five minutes at the onset, uh, because there's almost like a bell curve, in the first five to ten minutes of, an, um, of a crisis, you're getting actually pretty accurate info coming from the scene. These are witnesses and victims live tweeting stuff. Um, and so then you address that, but in the next 20 to 30 minutes as the situation is locked down, this is where news media outlets are on scene. They need to fill the space. They need to get you know, their opinions out. And this is the most important time for you to be there to provide factual information. Absolutely. Now, look, Chris, that's, that's our time for today. But look, uh, great stuff. Um, glad to know. Just one word of caution. Do not tweet while you're repelling. Uh, it's the only thing I can tell you. <laughs> So <laughs> we don't you. want that to be on Facebook either, you bet. All right. Hey, look, folks, so now we're halfway through. So now let's, we're going to start diving into some really good stuff now, too. So I get the chance now to introduce Anil Chavla. Anil's the founder and CEO of Archive Social. While I do it the correct way this time, I'm going to read his bio while I post his question for you. So where does your agency need the most help when it comes to your social media strategies? Again, select all that apply. You need help with compliance with public records law. You need help enforcing your social media policy and keeping your presence clean. You need help uh, staying responsive to citizens, or uh, you need help communicating what's happening on social media to your leadership differently than the community, right? You've also got to man or communicate to your leadership. So you need, where do you need the most help? Compliance with public records law, enforcing your social media policy, keeping your presence clean, staying responsive to citizens, and communicating what's happening to your social media leadership. Uh, while you guys are doing that, let me finish reading Anil's uh, bio here. So he's also the founder, again, as I said, CEO of Archive Social. It is the public sector's leading provider of technology to help law enforcement agencies archive and manage risk related to social media. As you've seen from the first two presenters, there's a tremendous amount of risk here. Their technology is trusted by hundreds of government agencies, ranging from small town police departments and sheriff's office to some of the most prominent law enforcement agencies in the nation, including Chicago PD, Dallas PD, Miami PD, the U.S. Department of Justice, which, by the way, is the world's largest law firm. The company was selected for the prestigious Code for America Accelerator in 2013, recognized as a 2014 cool vendor in government by leading analysts from Gartner, honored as a GovTech 100 company earlier this year by Government Technology Magazine, and he's also the co-host of the Wicked Cool GovTech social podcast. It's Wicked Cool because they actually made the mistake of inviting me on there as a guest one time. It was a blast. So let's go see, Anil, what the results were. Wow, good spread here. Half of the people need help with compliance with public records law, so a lot of risk there. 40% uh, need help enforcing their social media policy, keeping their presence clean. Wow, this is a big one, too. I mean, I didn't realize it would be this big. 74% say staying responsive to citizens. You heard Chris and Jennifer talk about that, how important it is. And then communicating what's happening with their leadership team, about 50%. I didn't expect it to be that big on the other ones, but, boy, that's big on the staying responsive to citizens, Anil. So, hey, I'm going to turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Well, Morgan, thank you so much for the wicked cool intro as well. And I, I can I just say this is a real honor to be uh, a participant on this presentation, this academy training with uh, Jennifer, Chris, and also Chief Grogan. Um, as you've heard, uh, these, are, these folks are leading practitioners in social media management when it comes to, to use in, in law enforcement. And as we come up on the hour here, I want to remind everybody, this is a 90-minute presentation, and, and you really don't want to miss Chief Grogan's presentation. So if you're able to hang around, please do so. Now, all three of these individuals um, are sharing with you the benefits of social media, and, and truly it's undeniable today uh, in terms of how important it is first to be on social media and, and, and also undeniable how many benefits you can have, as Chris just talked about, correcting misinformation and communicating during a crisis. So it's those really key events, but also day-to-day, -day, as Jennifer talked about, with the helicopter flying over, uh, building that relationship with the audience communicating in a transparent fashion, having the accountability as well that Morgan introduced us with. All that together 
touches everything you do in government. And with social media, you have that two-way conversation, that open dialogue, all incredibly important. But I'm going to talk about the other side, which is also undeniable, which is also important, the legal side, the policy side. And that side can be a challenge. So my goal here in the next 10 minutes or so is to dive a little bit deeper into those challenges, talk about records compliance, the legal need, talk about the, the issue about around being responsive as three quarters of you are, 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 are challenged by, uh, and, and focus on what's happening in the space with some real case studies and examples of how your agency might approach this in a more effective manner, both um, ensuring your legal requirements are covered as well as uh, really staying on top of risk and being responsive to, 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 to issues, particularly in crisis situations. Uh, so a lot of tips here that I'd like to share, and hope, my hope here is to arm you all with some, some action items around both practices and potentially technology for you to explore uh, in your agency. So let me get started, and the first thing I want to address, about 50% of you said that an area that, that you could really use some help with is, is being compliant with the records law. Now, I'm imagining that some percentage of you are also asking, what records law, or what do I need to do there? So I want to provide a brief uh, overview of, of, of records requirements um, as many of you know, as all of you know, should know, there, there are public records laws in your state. Uh, and I, I brought up an example here in this slide deck from California, uh, the Public Records Act. But every state, Texas, Florida, all the states have, have, have different different uh, laws that actually look a lot like this. They all kind of have the same premise to them, the same type of language. They all come out of the Freedom of Information Act at the federal level. And um, again, you should this should be this is not new to anybody because you've had email you've had other documents that you have to archive and keep records of uh, social media because of how important it is and again as we heard from Chris uh, the use of it in a crisis situation heard from Jennifer day to day how important it is falls under these requirements um, the way they were this law was written years ago covers social media and, and, and it, the reason for that is if you look at the language when you look at what defines a public record again in your state the wording might be slightly different but Almost every state has this phrase about regardless of physical form. And in law enforcement, if you think about that, if you received a crime tip on a piece of paper, that sure is an important record. If you receive that crime tip in an email, of course that's a record. So why would it be any different if you received a crime tip on a, a direct message or potentially even on a public comment? So that is, that is the core of, 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 of one of the, the biggest challenges in government is while we're using social media for so many important needs, um, we have to have the record keeping to comply with the laws. Now, a lot of states have taken that law that's been around for decades um, that does cover social media, and they've specifically explored the application of that law to social media to, to provide a clarity to, to, to local agencies. And again, here in California, the example is uh, CalRIM, the Records Information uh, Management Office, uh, has created a records guidebook. Uh, this is official guidance from them uh, to state, uh, state local agencies that describes when social media can create a record that must be retained uh, and even talks about needing a plan to export records from the social media sites out of Twitter, out of Facebook, to your own record-keeping system. Um, and so I'd encourage you to check this out if you're in California, but also in your state, a uh, simple Google search for social media records in your state um, will we'll lead you to some resources, including resources that we have on Archive Social's website about the laws and requirements in your state. Now, there's the legal side of you know, academically social media can constitute a record, and then there's the reality and uh, I won't, I won't uh, dive on this too much because I think we've already had examples from, from our first two speakers on how important social media is and how you might generate communications that are of record value. But two quick examples from our customer base. Uh, another tragic incident, uh, you know, Chris mentioned the, the shooting in Dallas. Of course, that's an incident where social media played uh, a heavy role in the communications, but also the Orlando shooting that happened just prior to that. Uh, the, worst, the worst shooting in the history of the United States and um, this was an area where social media really paid its dividends. The Orlando P police in the middle of the night um, did a very, very smart thing to say, no emails, no phone calls, all updates over Twitter. And in my discussions with law enforcement agencies, I hope that many of you would agree, um, the, the, the journalist population, the reporters, they actually really like Twitter. And they really like it when you do this because they now know where they can come for information. And it's not the struggle to get through to you. And again, this feed, not only that first tweet, but all the updates that came out, um, really talking about the situation, of course, generates um, records of value that are nowhere else but on your Twitter feed. So that's uh, just one example in terms of a crisis situation. The example I have on the bottom, um, you may recognize this photo of this, unfortunate, this, this poor dog that had its mouth duct taped. Uh, this comes out of the city of South Daytona where uh, not only can incidents in real life create crisis 
situations for you, but incidents online can also create a crisis, and, and, and something that happens in the virtual world can lead to legal risk, can lead to you having to respond and potentially creating records of value. In this incident, a woman posted this photo of, of the dog's mouth being duct taped. Um, she was not even in the city of South Daytona. She just lo- had her location tagging on wrong. And when it hit, hit her face, personal Facebook page, it was shared and shared and shared. And ultimately, the residents of South Daytona uh, came across it, and there was an enormous public outcry of how could this uh, act of animal cruelty happen? What in the world is the police doing about this? And so this outcry happened on the Facebook page for City of South Daytona. Uh, again, they, they didn't start this. This didn't even happen in South Daytona, but they were hit by it. And they use social media to their credit to turn that audience's perception from negativity to positivity by communicating very transparently, very frequently, working with law enforcement around the country to track down the woman that posted this photo, which they ultimately did. And by the end of it, um, the the citizens were thanking the police officers on on the Facebook page. Now, during this process, it generated 24,000 comments in a few days. This is a city that sees maybe two or three comments a day. They got 24,000 comments in a few days and the national media was making records requests for this information. So a lot of different ways that social media can play a role uh, um, in, in your day-to-day and have important content generated, but particularly in these crisis situations. Now, moving on, you may be thinking, some of you may be thinking, well, in terms of archiving and, and being compliant with the law, right now it's out on Twitter and Facebook, so isn't it public? Can I, can I send folks to that information? Uh, and it really is your responsibility as an agency to to have control of this information and, and produce it. And I'm going to give you some more data on that. Uh, but at a high level, here's an example where the Seattle PD has Twitter feeds uh, for police incidents, and a citizen noticed that um, that the Twitter feed did not seem to have the information they expected to be there. And the citizen was wondering, well, did I miss it? Did, was that deleted? And he issued this records request asking for the archives of all the Twitter feeds uh, in a tweet, he said, consider this a public records request. So he basically made a record, public records request for social media using social media. Uh, and that really is a sign of the times. Now, the, the Seattle PD said, okay, we will fulfill this request, but you need to go fill out our proper uh, request form on our website. You can't just tweet us a public records request. But, you're, but the fact that you, you want social media content as public record, yes, we will fulfill that. Now, that, this, is, this is not unusual. This happened two years ago. This happens every now and then. Your agency itself may not have received a records request that specifically called out Twitter and Facebook content, but what we are seeing very consistently across public agencies uh, is that records requests today, in the way that they're written and scoped, often do include social media or should include social media. So, for example, if you have a records request related to all notifications of the street closure, well, if it was during a sudden weather incident or some other sudden event, you may have used social media to communicate about it. Even if it wasn't sudden, you may have used social media to clarify a question about the street closure, and therefore your social media content would fall under that request. And similarly for all emails and communications and these other phrases that are pretty all-encompassing. So you really, really do think to need to think about your social media as a record, and chances are if you are responding to anything that your citizens are saying or clarifying anything or communicating during any type of emergency or crisis situation, information that won't be elsewhere, your social media pages today contain records that must be maintained as public record and could even uh, show up in, in legal circumstances outside of public records requirements. So I'm going to speed up here because I know I'm running out of time and we've got a lot of folks to get to. I mentioned you cannot rely on the networks for this data. Uh, we actually ran a study on this um, at Archive Social to understand how much data is really disappearing from Facebook and Twitter and how much of it's actually still there in case you had a records request. And uh, the key point here is that Facebook and Twitter do not have any sort of policy or, or guarantee that they will retain your social media content. Uh, for you, even uh, for your particularly for your records requirements, but uh, especially after someone deletes it. So if, if a citizen deletes something or you delete something, it's gone. In fact, Facebook's page for law enforcement says that you can issue a subpoena as long as you issue the subpoena before the content's deleted. And when we studied this, we we studied 400 public agencies across the course of one month, and saw that those 400 public agencies that had Facebook pages had nearly 7,800. Uh, posts or comments deleted from their Facebook profiles in, in aggregate. So, you know, on average, almost 20 records per, per customer lost in one month. And when you talk to these agencies, uh, this is quite an eye-opening number because most agencies are not deleting anything. They're actually hiding. 
but citizens are deleting quite a bit, and sometimes staff is deleting even if, you, if they've been instructed not to delete. So this data disappears. It's not going to be on Facebook and Twitter. You really have to take it in your control. Uh, and uh, as I get through this, I want to share some, some incidents where having that record keeping has really protected some agencies. Uh, and you may not have heard about this in national news, but it's worth hearing about because this is something that could be very real for, for your agency. It's, it's the kind of stuff that just happens that um, you often don't hear about uh, outside of trainings like this. So for the first example I'll give you, I have two examples here with a law enforcement agency in South Florida. And I've kind of hammered on the issue of social media as a public record, but it's also just a record. It's a record that could show up in any legal circumstance. And in this incident, uh, what happened was the police department had communicated out that a local company might be a scam. You should avoid giving them your personal information. And they did this because a law firm had told them that this company was a scam. Now, the company, as you might imagine, did not agree with this. And so the company saw these posts, contacted the city and the police department, and said, hey, you need to remove that. We are not a scam. We're a legitimate operation. The police department followed through, removed the content. And then uh, shortly after, the company filed a, a lawsuit, an initial discovery request, requesting all uh, communications that the police department had put out about them being a scam, which, of course, included the Facebook content that they had asked to be deleted. So the, the, the good, the, while this is kind of a sticky situation that the city has to work through and show that they did everything they, they could have done correctly, that very first request asking for that, those communications that had already been deleted, that could have really put the police department in a hole here. And instead, uh, they had been archiving with us, so very easily they could respond to that records request and at least start that legal circumstance off being able to fulfill this requirement and not being in a hole uh, and missing information that they should have had. On the opposite side of the country in California, Santa Barbara PD, another police department, again, doing their job, right, protecting the citizens uh, and fulfilling city requirements. In this case, the police department was instructed to uh, put, put together a gun buyback program. Now, obviously, gun control, gun buyback, these are controversial topics. And so the conversation exploded on Facebook about this, and a lot of clarifications were made, and a lot of back and forth happened. And uh, it, in parallel, our, our team had been contacting the PD about the importance to archive. They recognized the importance ar to archive, but they never had an issue around social media being requested. And so they were moving somewhat slow on, on, on the topic with other priorities on their plate. And finally, our sales team said, hey, it takes three minutes to set up a trial. So they set up a trial, and three weeks in that trial while this gun buyback program was happening, the National Rifle Association issued a records request for all communications related to the gun buyback. And so we have actually published a case study with government technology on this in terms of how difficult it would have been to go through the Facebook pages and screenshot, how likely it would have been to miss content, and how important it was to have an archive in place. Uh, and so the PD certainly became a believer in being proactive on this and has been archiving ever since. So again, two success stories there where archiving uh, has either mitigated further risk or in fact deflected completely a situation that could have gone uh, much uh, in a really negative fashion or could have, could have been a problem if they were unable to produce the information. Now, when, you come, when it comes to archiving, certainly recommend uh, to evaluate the solutions out there. And, and there are very different types of solutions, some that focus on social media, some that focus on other types of content. But really pay attention to the details there. When, when, her, when Jennifer was talking about live streaming, you know, live streaming is important. Periscope is something very new. So social media has a lot of complexities to it. So you want to make sure that you have complete records uh, in order to respond to these requests. Now, on top of the, having really great record keeping and the ability to produce the records, there are some other uh, areas of technology that have been developed now uh, that may be interesting to you. And Jennifer touched on this earlier with her presentation. When you're, when you're bringing all this content together and you're archiving it, there's also now the ability to centralize some control. And in fact, we now have technology that can create automatic alerts, whether there's a violation of your policy because somebody is being profane and offensive, or whether citizens are asking questions, or whether there are situations involving public safety. As Chris said, you want to wait and see if the citizens start talking about that crisis situation, well, now you can put alerting in place to be, become aware of what the citizens are saying about any type of emergency management situation and get that delivered to you so you can act on it. There's also analytics and reporting technology out there that, that it's worth looking at. A lot of public uh, agencies are having success with technology that can highlight the active individuals that continue to comment on your Facebook page. Some of those people, you might call them trolls because they're criticizing you. Some of them might be your promoters. But getting a better sense of the individuals in your community that are active on your presence and whether they are supporters or not 
Um, it can be helpful in your social media strategy, as well as just monitoring how negative and, and positive the response is. So this type of technology is out there and something that we could certainly talk about more if you're interested. Uh, there, are, there are many vendors that provide technology in this realm. But what, one thing I want to leave you with is we talked about crisis situations right before my presentation. If you're in a crisis, uh, and you don't have any kind of archiving, analytics, monitoring technology in place, you can visit this website, govcrisis.social. And uh, Archive Social actually has a program where we will provide our technology at no cost, completely pro bono, no commitment, nothing at all, except we want your feedback. And you'll get access to our technology to help you get through that crisis situation for 30 days uh, just to ensure that you're protected because it's so important that public agencies like yours are able to continue to use social media to serve the citizens. And with that, we'll transition to questions. So back to you, Morgan. Sorry about that. My thumb doesn't work fast enough for the mute button. So hey, uh, Neil, real quickly here, because uh, we're going to get to Chief Grogan about this. So a uh, couple questions that came in. First of all, how often does archive, how often do you capture, I mean, there's a ton of new content out there. How often do you capture this stuff, um, and how far back can you go with it? Great question. So, so in terms of our archiving technology, uh, what we're able to do is able to we talk directly to the social networks, and we get as much data as they'll still provide us. So for a lot of our customers who've been on Facebook, Twitter, and these other sites for three, four, five years, we actually do go back to the inception of the account and get everything we possibly can out of that social network that the social network will give us. Uh, and then we do archive in near real time. That technology does exist now. So uh, sites like Facebook, in fact, we're able to get that in real time as long as Facebook delivers it to us in real time. But we can try to get it as soon as possible, and that's critically important because something can, can uh, be deleted within moments that, that has the critical information. You're still responsible for that under public records law. If you were sent a private message uh, or a mention uh, that would be of record value, but it was deleted before you could archive it, then you've, you've lost your ability to archive a record you were supposed to have. Yeah, because that was one of the issues, right? Even if they launched their page, like, say, more than two, more than three years ago, um, you can still, as long as that data exists, right, you can still go back and archive all of it and now create this searchable record of it, right? That's correct. We'll pull it all in uh, and from the history. Now, again, anything that was deleted or lost, and as, we see, as we've seen in the study, there's quite a bit of right. content that gets lost over time. That is not going to be there anymore. So that's why you do want to start archiving sooner rather than later. And Anil, this is always the $64,000 question because it's not 64000 But, I mean, people always I look at having worked in government, right, and you have two people say, I love the technology. The second question is, how much does it cost? So assuming everybody loves what Archive Social is doing, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the cost. We are dealing with public sector agencies. And what does the installation process involve? I mean, do you have to bring a forklift in? How easy is it? <laughs> Yeah, thanks for asking. And again, I, I want to be agnostic of that in the sense that there are many archiving companies out there. Now, we do focus specifically on public sector. Nearly 100% of our customers are cities and counties. And so our pricing is designed with that in mind. We understand budgets are limited. Now, most archiving solutions start at a few thousand dollars annual and go above that. Now, some companies charge for setup fees and exporting data. With Archive Social, you can see our pricing on our website. We have a fixed cost pricing that's based on the, the volume of social media that you have. Um, are you generating 1,000 records a month or 10,000 records a month? And we have a fixed cost, and then it's just, that's it. Uh, you can get the history of your accounts. You can export the data anytime you want, um, and you're protected at that fixed cost. And, and, and realistically, setting up social media archiving because it's all in the cloud, if you have the social networking credentials, it's less than 20 minutes for, the, for our average customer to be archiving and fully protected. Yeah, well, I tell you, Neil, there's so much stuff here. I mean, you're going to stick around, right, because we've got some more questions here, but we want to get to Chief Grogan. So hang tight. Don't go anywhere, because the next person we want to talk to today is going to be Chief of Police in Dunwoody, Georgia, Billy Grogan. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Billy here before we get started, um, but let's go to this first question as I introduce him here. So Chief Grogan wants to know, and it's very simple. Do you, does your agency use humor in your social media programs? It's simple, yes or no. Kind of reminds me of the movie uh, uh, Men in Black. It, you know, they say we're from the government. We have no sense of humor that we're aware of. <laughs> but I think in this day and age, right, you're going to have to have some humor. So while you guys are answering that, whether or not you use humor or not, let me tell you a little bit about Chief Grogan. 33 years in law enforcement. He's a seasoned police ex executive. He's got extensive knowledge of law enforcement best practices, having served previously in an accredited department under CALEA, the Commission for the Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies, and he's currently the chief of a department that is state certified. So that's a very high bar. It's a very high standard. He's very comfortable in analyzing complex problems. 
developing good progressive solutions and preparing, as we all love to do in law enforcement and public sector, comprehensive reports. So, Chief, let's take a look at the um, results here. Half, oh boy, this couldn't be split any better. Half say they do, half say they don't. And, you know, we kind of go back to Captain Chung's uh, thing about how when they're lighthearted, it's talk one way. When they're very serious, it's the other. So that's kind of a good starting point for you, Chief. So I turn the floor over to you. Morgan, thank you very much. Uh, that That is an interesting response. Hopefully, uh, uh, something that I say today will convince the 50% that do not use social media to, to begin using it. So I titled this, uh, Build a Positive Relationship with Your Audience Using Humor. And, uh, you know, I, I think all of us would acknowledge that uh, today a positive relationship with the communities that we serve is even more important than it has been, uh, I believe, more so than in my entire uh, career. So it's extremely important. Many, many Police departments are in communities where there's many challenges uh, with that relationship. I look at uh, uh, social media as using social media as being an extension of our community policing programs. You know, we can only have so many meetings and, and so many citizen police academies or ride-alongs, but we can really almost have unlimited number of people on our social media platforms. As Chris discussed earlier. Uh, you know, social media can be extremely important, especially in a crisis, and a lack of a presence on social media after a critical incident can contribute to a lack of trust in the department and can cause irreparable harm in the relationship that uh, police departments have in their community. So let's move into the uh, why. Uh, What's the point of using social media? You know, uh, in many cases, it doesn't take a lot of time and effort, but in, in some cases, to do it right, it does take some time, talent, and treasure uh, to engage with your community. So one of the most important things is it helps build that positive relationship in your community with those that you serve. It also gives you an opportunity to educate and inform your audience, and, and this can be true in a lot of different ways, whether it's crime prevention information or why the police uh, do what we do. You know, why, why does um, a police officer act the way he does on a traffic stop? And so you can educate and inform your audience. Also, it's a, a way to demonstrate our transparency, to let the public know exactly what we're doing and why we're doing things and so that they can see what we're doing. Obviously, I'm not talking about uh, you know, talking about privileged information, but uh, the, the normal actions of a police department. And then lastly, I believe social media provides a glimpse into the human side of police officers, which I think in the long run over time will help build that positive relationship uh, even, even more and can, strength, can strengthen it. So why use humor? Uh, on on your social media that's that's a that's a good question i think there's some very good reasons one is people uh respond to humor uh i believe you'll get more likes uh more comments more shares uh when humor is involved uh, this has been true for uh the Dunwoody police department uh throughout uh, our years of using social media um it's uh it definitely increases that engagement, interaction, comments uh, with the community. Uh, your audience uh, gets to see the human side of police officers uh, through humor. You know, when we um, put humor out there, you know, everybody loves it, and, and it really demonstrates our humanity and just gives them a, a glimpse into in who we are as, as people as opposed to just uh, a badge. And then humor provides a mechanism for for more effective communication. Uh, if you do a Google search about uh, how to um, uh, do better at public speaking or something like that, all almost all the the people writing books are talking about that, uh, or talk about how to use humor, how to sprinkle in humor, uh, how to use that to be more effective. And I think uh, when you're the written word, uh, you can apply the same principle. And so I think uh, using humor uh, certainly helps us communicate more effectively. 
so how do, how do we use it effectively once once we've decided hey we're going to uh, we're going to use social uh, we're going to use humor in our social media program how how do we do it there is a right way and a wrong way to do it so uh, the first and probably foremost uh, point is never joke about a serious subject uh, child molestation, someone getting hurt, uh, someone being attacked, or another person's misfortune. Never joke about a serious matter like that. As Chris was talking earlier um, about uh, you know communicating in a crisis, when there's a crisis uh, going on, it's not a time to try to be funny. Uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, I'm sure all of you have seen comedians on stage that try to. Uh, make fun of some serious situation, and sometimes it really falls uh, pretty flat and can have serious repercussions for your agency if, if you do so. Another point is never make fun of someone directly. So, uh, you know, you can talk about, and I'll, I'm going to give you some examples in a few minutes, but uh, you can talk about, you know, something happening, but never really identify or point to uh you know someone and make fun of them uh that that can uh, backfire as well and uh, cause problems for the department so let's go through a, just a, a couple of examples uh here that i think uh, are Im important this one is uh, uh just a little um facebook post about a shoplifting suspect uh, they uh fled the scene and uh you know, got stuck. They didn't plan for all the traffic around our mall, Primer Mall here in Dunwoody. And uh, so the officers that posted this, you know, really talked about how all the citizens helped uh, contribute to that. And it got, you know, a number of comments and, and shares and likes and, and was uh, well received. This one uh, got quite a bit of attention. It was... Uh, uh, Two calls uh, that was on a, a particular holiday. Somebody called to complain that their kid was not in school and they were mad. And you know it was Memorial Day. Of course, their kid wasn't in school. And then another neighbor called uh, to report a strong odor of barbecue coming from the apartment next to his. Wanted us to investigate. Well, it's Memorial Day. Obviously, a lot of people are out there um, uh, barbecuing on Memorial Day. Here's one with an officer, just uh, one of our uh, patrol officers, just kind of acting silly, making faces uh, with some kids at a at a community event, and uh, those go over really well. And then here's one from uh, Twitter: uh, Shoplifters arrested and claimed incident is misunderstanding. They thought tax-free weekend meant stuff was free. Uh, so you know, using hashtags to kind of help uh, with what you're trying to do uh, also also helps. This was a shoplifter from, again, from Walmart that was m moving really slow. Uh, he was actually in one of the little little buggies for handicapped people, and he was trying to escape uh, with that. So uh, they kind of pointed that out and got uh, a good bit of interaction. And this one was huge. Uh, we had um, uh, someone that uh, was driving recklessly, and I think they'd been drinking, and it was a, a minor. And so the officer came up with these seven things to uh, don't do. Uh, uh, you know, if you're going to uh, drink and, and do all this. And so you can, I'm not going through the whole list, but it was uh, lots of comments, uh, lots of clicks, uh, reached over 144,000 people. So it was very, very successful. Great use of humor. Here's a little something that's kind of educational, uh, a little lesson in uh, criminal law. Uh, when a person's a party to a crime, I shoplifted at Petco and I helped. And uh, you know, officers get pretty creative sometimes, and and it's uh, very helpful. Here's one recently, the last one. Uh, us waiting for the opening of the new Dunkin' Donuts, uh, which is about to open in Dunwoody. That was a recent one, which uh, uh, got a lot of good comments and, and likes. So how, how do you effectively use uh, social media? You know, you can't just throw 
funny stuff up there, so how do you do that? I think one is post information about real calls and add your humorous perspective. So most of that, most of the information that we posted about was actually, um, you know, real calls that our officers have been on. So I think that's extremely important. Uh, don't use generic humor from the Internet. Uh, every once in a while I think we'll post something um, but you have to be very cautious of that because it may be tied into something bigger or maybe not as good that you might not be aware of if you don't do a lot of research. So, so be cautious of that. Uh, also use photos, and I think this has been mentioned before, photos and videos when possible. Uh, they tend to get uh, create more engagement. And uh, certainly if anybody has any questions, please uh, go ahead and start uh, asking those. Um, don't be afraid to poke fun at yourself, such as the one, the photo we had with the Dunkin' Donuts uh, or making the face or, or whatever. It's, uh, people love people that have self-deprecating humor, so it's, it's okay to poke fun at ourselves. Uh, include a bigger picture message when possible. Uh, I think um, that's extremely uh, important, uh, such as maybe an educational thing uh, as we did about the party of the crime. And then use humor sparingly. Every post does not uh, doesn't need to have humor in it, and you don't need need to use humor that often. Uh, I'm not sure what the percent is that you should use, but uh, but it's definitely not uh, all the time. It, it will get old uh, quickly. And then uh, don't force it. When in doubt, leave it out. So that's that's a good motto to have. If you if you're ever thinking about should I post this or not. You've already answered your question because if you're if you're having to question it, that means you probably shouldn't post it. Let me give you an example of, of a case where I posted something uh, trying to be funny that uh, didn't go quite as well as I thought it would. So actually, uh, I went back and found these um, posts on Twitter through Archive Social from 2011. So it was another use of uh, Archive Social. So I posted this myself uh, personally, and back then I was doing most of the posting on social media for us, for our department. But I, a man dressed in woman's clothing damaged a flower pot, a sign, and then pulled the fire alarm at the Crown Plaza. What is going on? So I was, you know, trying to be kind of humorous after I read the report about that happening, and I, I had actually typed this up a few different ways and and was trying to be funny. Uh, but uh, and kept kept erasing it. But finally, I, I posted this really quickly. I got this response: "Not funny. The largest conference of transgender people in this country is happening in Dunwoody this weekend." Your tweet, tacky. And another one similar that said, "The largest conference of transgender people in this country is happening in Dunwoody." So, anyways, needless to say, I responded very quickly and said, "No offense intended. Was just, you know, trying to be." humorous and nobody ever responded after that and I think this group had 10,000 the TG World News had 10,000 followers luckily uh, in 2011 our uh, Twitter feed didn't uh, blow up but certainly it probably would today but uh, we I've certainly learned a lesson since then so with that um, I'll uh, turn it back over to Morgan well hey chief uh, as you know like we said it, it's a uh, you actually, that kind of leads into your last tweet, kind of leads into one of the questions I have, because we have a whole, when you look at this young group of officers growing up, people in public safety, um, the millennial stuff, you know, what what does happen when one of your officers crosses the line with humor? How, you know, what how do you train them to begin with? Kind of what's your policy on posting while they're on duty? Uh, what kind of thing, what kind of guidance do you give them? And then what happens when somebody does cross the line? Sure, we're, we're a... Uh... We're kind of very decentralized with our social media program, so we're a small department of 58, and I think we have between 18 and 20 different people at our department that post on social media. So we do uh, we provide a two-hour training block for everyone that uses social media, kind of uh, talking about the things that uh, we want them to post. And so occasionally, obviously, somebody will will make a mistake, such as myself uh, previously. So what we try to do is use that as an opportunity for education and not an opportunity for discipline. We've never had a situation where someone has repeatedly uh, done something they shouldn't. So most people understand the the limitations and 
and our guidelines, and we don't have any issues with that. But every once in a while, we'll post something, and if it's something too bad, we'll take it down. But uh, usually, we use it as an educational opportunity for the person that posted it, as well as the rest of us that post on social media. Right. No, and that's that's a tough balance, especially for younger officers as they're maturing in their um, as they're maturing in their role and stuff. So, which kind of leads me then to you know kind of a balance. Here kind of a balance, right? How do you balance the right amount of humor with posts with no humor? I mean, sometimes there's like what Captain Shung was talking about. You've got things that are very factual. We have an incident versus you've got some lighthearted things. So how do you strike that balance between the two? Well, I think, uh, you know, we, we try to have a, a, a mix. So, uh, you know, if, if, it's, if we're posting things, you know, there's wanted people or, you know, uh, you know factual kind of things, it's usually not conducive to adding humor into it. And so for those kind of things, uh, we, uh, you know, just post them. So I would say probably, you know, our mix of humor is probably 10% or less, uh, and it, it is really driven by circumstances. So there could be a week where a lot of very humorous things pop up, and we may use humor a little bit more because of the circumstances that dictated it. And maybe next week, not as much because there just weren't weren't any circumstances that kind of dictated uh, the the use of humor. So there there is a balance. Uh, you know, certainly, as I said earlier, never try to in, I never try to force humor into a situation that should be factual or is, is dealing with a crisis or some serious matter. But use it sparingly for sure. So which kind of brings me to the same question I gave uh, to Jennifer and Captain Chung, which for you, Chief, is. What kind of benefits, now that you've been introducing, you've been using humor a little bit more, obviously we saw great engagement on those posts. What kind of benefits are you seeing for your officers in the community? Does it make them more approachable? Do people realize, hey, these guys and girls are really human? You know, they're not what they've been portrayed to be. How is that, how has the benefit been for you in your local community? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head, Morgan. It, it, it certainly uh, has made our officers more approachable. We We have... Uh, you know, citizens come up to officers on a uh, almost daily basis, and and I get contacted as well. Uh, that just really compliment us on our uh, Facebook page and our other social media platforms, and they always uh, talk about the humor. Uh, they they uh, post on our page, and you know, love love me some Dunwoody Police Department, and you see comments like that all the time. I even had a lady send me an email uh, earlier this year that said, you know, she had an interaction with our department that was very positive, but uh, she said that, um, you know, from what I can tell by looking at your Facebook page, uh, you guys have an awesome department. Now, she, she made a judgment outside of the one encounter she had with one of our officers by what she has seen on Facebook. So it does make a difference in how people view your department when you use social media and you use it effectively. Well, outstanding. And look, stand by, because I'm actually going to pull something um, on everybody. They weren't exactly prepared for. We're being so efficient with time. We actually have time, and I'm going to do, I'm going to take the moderator's privilege, and if everybody comes off mute real quick, I want to kind of do a round robin here real quick, a, a couple quick questions, and we'll do through every, I mean, this is for everybody. So we're going to start off with Jennifer. So the question is for everybody is knowing what you know now, knowing what you know today, if you were starting over today, what would you do different? Uh, you know, another, kind of like what lessons have you learned? But like Jennifer, if you were starting today with everything you know, if you had to pick up, pull up, move somewhere else, and start a program from scratch, what would you do different today than what you did starting this, you know, a few years ago? Wow. Um, I think – when we first started um, getting really big on social media, we had a lot of uh, – our social media outlets were kind of spread out. Like several of our units had their own pages. Everything was kind of all over the place. Nobody was really um, paying attention to who was posting, and people would create a Facebook page and then not do anything with it. Um, and so we've really tried to corral that. That's, that's still kind of an issue sometimes, <laughs> even though we now have a process in place, you know, to, to get that approved. And we really want people to go through our main sites because we have such a following. Um, but I think that would be the first thing is just um, to, to come up with a plan for that first because I guess nobody could really guess how big social media was going to get so fast. So, Captain Chung, for you, as you were busy rappelling down, you know, tweeting out pictures, 
What would you do differently now? Now that I mean, you're you're in the heart of everything. You've got Silicon Valley out there. What would you do different today um, if you were taking over again in a new department and starting from scratch? You know, I, I wouldn't focus or chase the numbers, and by that I mean the followers. Um, it's really intoxicating in the beginning to try to do whatever you can to grow your followership. And a lot of temptation I see across the country are people, departments, you know, they create this this awesome viral video. It goes viral nationwide and maybe even global, and they keep trying to chase that fame. And it's great because they get hundreds of thousands of followers. My argument would be that all doesn't matter because your focus is your community. So the community that you serve, those are the followers you're after. And the, the true way to get that takes time. It's just naturally, organically talking to them on all the platforms that you're on, answering their questions, talking to them when it's good news, bad news, ugly news, whatever it is. And over time, that conversation will be seen by other residents, and you will grow a community focused primarily around the, the jurisdiction you serve. Don't worry about how well you're liked across the country. It's not about that. It's about the people we serve. That is an excellent answer because I think you're right. I think people, see, they want the numbers. Oh, well, we have a million followers. Yeah, but you're a count of 5,000, so I'm not sure exactly, exactly how those yeah. other, yeah, 900, you know, some odd are going to help you out there. But that's, that's, a, that's a great perspective. So, and Neil, hold on. I'm going to get to you last because you're, you're the tech guy. So I want to ask Chief Grogan. Chief Grogan, same thing for you today. You know, what would you do differently now that you've been using humor and stuff? If you had to pull up stakes, start all over as a chief in a brand-new department, what would you do different? Yeah, I think when we first started back in uh, 2009 with our social media program, we we really just we weren't very engaged as we are today. And so I think uh it took uh, uh quite a bit of time for us to really get into a rhythm of how often we should post and what we should post about and and really get our social media program to where we're we're really clicking on all cylinders and uh, we're reaching the, our target audience with the information that they want. So I think we, I would focus uh, starting back out uh, somewhere else on getting the message out to our community uh, in a timely fashion and, and, you know, creating that engagement with the community. Yep, another good lesson. And, Anil, for you, now that you've been involved in the technology, now that you've seen a lot of this change, as a company, I mean, if you, if you were going to start all over again in this space, would there be anything that you would do different, any uh, things that you've learned now that you say, gee, if we just started doing something like this a little bit earlier? Um, what's your perspective on this now that, now that the practitioners have talked, you're the enabler? What are your thoughts? Well, I'll tell you that one thing that, that's, that came up in our history of our company, and we've had to uh, adapt to it and build technology to help address this for our customers, is we really came out with this focus on social media as a record, which is, at its core, the, was the right thing to do, uh, a real challenge. But right out the gate, this is, you know, four or five years ago, there was a lot less that had happened in terms of social media being requested as a record. And so a lot of agencies saw it coming and they acted proactively. But even at that time, they were dealing with other challenges related to the record, such as enforcing their policy, uh, dealing with what's really become a hot topic of around First Amendment. What can citizens say and how do you deal with that? And I think that we could have had more of a focus on that early. We ended up learning that, working with hundreds upon hundreds of agencies, that record keeping was foundational, but day to day they need some help with that risk management. And uh, Morgan, if I could, just to, to address the question you, you shared with, or that you asked to the other presenters, I was thinking about that from the standpoint of the agencies we work with and, you know, what could they have done differently uh, now that hindsight's 2020. And one thing that we, see co we saw commonly, and we still occasionally see it, is this approach to social media that, that's cognizant of the risk and the policy that causes you to a tiptoe in a way into social media that doesn't really give you the benefits. So your attorney might go, well, yeah, you can have a Facebook page, but you need to hide every comment that shows up. Well, that's really not going to serve you or your citizens. And I think that looking back, what, what we could have advised agencies to do and what I advise agencies to do now is, you, you have to be on social media. Your citizens are there. You have, to, you have to be a part of that conversation. So approach it in a way that makes sense. Have the two-way conversation. Get out there. Have humor. Show your, your human side of your agency. But everything you do, operate considering that worst-case scenario. And that's going to drive you to be proactive and have the right policies in place. Uh, you know, anticipate a tweet's going to go wrong, as Chief Crokin talked about. Anticipate that there's going to be a crisis situation, right? And, and, and put some things in place, and it's not that hard. You can address these things up front, and then you can benefit from social media in a more authentic fashion, as all of our presenters currently do. 
Well, Neil, that's a great way to end this up. Great lessons learned from everybody. And look, first of all, I want to thank everybody. We are coming to the end of our time. So out of respect for your time, we're going to have to close it up here. So first of all, I want to tell you right now that within 48 hours, Government Technology will provide everybody with a link to the recording for your reference or to share with your colleagues. Um, and I want to thank some folks. First of all, let me thank Jennifer Herber, Austin, Captain Chris Shung, Mountain View PD, Chief Brilly Grogan, Dunwoody, and Anil Chavla, uh, also our corporate sponsor and uh, partner for this. We really want to thank you guys for being on. And a special thanks, like I said, to our partners there at Archive Social. This is the way we bring this training. So please, please, please fill out that survey at the end. Let us know what you like. Let us know what to keep. Let us know what to change. Uh, because this is really about you, uh, and I'm very thankful that everybody came together and did this. So thank you once again. We look forward to seeing you soon at yet another government technology event. So on behalf of the team, the Center for Digital Government and GovTech, uh, thank you, folks. Have a great afternoon. Have a safe afternoon, and we will see you again soon online, same bat time, same bat channel. Everybody have a great afternoon.